Hi, my name is Tom and you are at level 25 in mastering Einstein's special relativity. This is the C episode, not for all. We will derive special relativity the way Einstein did it in 1905. It will take quite some time. It's tedious, it's difficult, but if you really, really want to understand how he did it in 1905, then this video is for you. So here we go. There are two ways, well, there are many ways to derive special relativity, but there's only one true derivation. That's the one in his original paper in 1905. The one you will find online many times is the popular one in 1916, but I will do the one in 1905. And before we start, I am going to introduce my rigorous notation. I've introduced it from level 19, I think, and upwards, but it's, um, it helps me, it helped me a lot. And this is it. If an observer Q sees an event E, he will write down the location like this, and the time he will write it down like this. If you look online, for the Lorentz transformation or Einstein's special relativity, you will see different symbols x, x prime, t, and t prime. I found them very confusing. I made a lot of mistakes using these, and uh, I got rid of all those mistakes when I used the more explicit notation I just introduced. The one Einstein used in 1905, and let me tell you, I'm a big fan of Einstein. I'm spending like hundreds of hours on these videos across a three year period of time it took me. But his notation is a little bit more tricky even than today's notation. It feels a bit like this. While the notation I'm going to use all the time is a bit like this. Okay, here we go. Relax, have coffee, put down your phone, focus, be in the here and the now. The first thing Einstein is going to talk about synchronous clocks from a single point of view. So here we have an observer, observer number one, and his, he has, well, two things on his mind, the clock, time, and space, the one dimensional X axis. Um, and let's imagine that there are imaginary clocks everywhere in the space of observer one and that all these clocks are telling the same time. So when a flash occurs at some location at some time that will be an event, the event will be the flash, observer one will write down where and when it happened. Of course in real life he has to wait for the light of the flash to reach his eye. The light has to travel from the flash to the observer. This is being ignored in uh, this derivation in special relativity, but we can add it later and I will do so in future levels, uh, which I call real world special relativity. But this is, uh, these clocks you have to imagine they are everywhere and as soon as something happens they will register they will uh, uh, witness the, the event and you will have instantaneously the time and location of the event without having to go out with your measuring device or look at your clock uh, and lose milliseconds because you have to look at the clock or wait for the light to be traveling to your eyes. So. Um, so this is what I said, uh, in real life the light needs travel time. We are going to ignore that travel time for now, um, so be aware. I wasn't aware, it took me uh, quite some effort to find out is it now included, yes or no, it isn't, uh, and that's okay, you know, but uh, we'll, we'll come back to this in the examples in the future levels. Again, the clocks. 
And let's say we pick two random locations, location A and B on the x-axis, and they both have their clocks because the clocks are everywhere. And I'm going to introduce something I call an event table. And the first event, E1, will be a light ray starting at A, traveling in the direction of B. And the x-coordinate of that event will be A, by definition, which we pick randomly. And the time will be, well, we don't know the time, doesn't really matter, but we write it down like the time of event 1 through the eyes of observer 1. As soon as this light ray hits B, we call this the second event. The second event will be at location B. And what will be the time of that event? Well, that's easy, because it will be the time of event 1 plus the distance B minus A divided by the speed of light, because it's a ray of light traveling from A to B. And how long does a light of ray, ray of light take to travel from A to B? B minus A divided by C, the speed of light. And then it's being bounced back and travels back from B to A. And that's what I call the third event. And the timestamp there is the timestamp of the second event plus again another B minus A over C. And the location, well, it came back at A, so the location is A again. So this should not be that difficult. Just imagine this flash line going back and forth between A and B. We can write down now this. The difference between the time difference between the first and the second event will be the same time difference between the second and the third event. Basically, we're saying here the light travels at the same speed to the left as it does to the right. It doesn't speed up or slow down intermediately because we picked A and B randomly. So whatever we pick for A and B, these differences between time will always be the same. And that's basically a way of saying it's a constant speed of light. Einstein wrote it down like this. This is his notation. Then we can do some mumbo jumbo. We can move stuff around and we get this equation. Then we can substitute the timestamp of event 2 through the eyes of observer 1 by looking at the event table, which was b minus a over c. We shovel again and we get this equation. And Einstein wrote it down like this. These are really snapshots from his paper eh, you're seeing here. So we have mastered the first two uh, formulas, equations in his paper, and this is what they are. And they define a constant speed of light, and they define the concept of synchronous imaginary clocks being everywhere in space. Now I simplify things a little bit. I'm not going to pick A randomly. I'm going to pick A to be at the origin of the frame of reference of observer 1. So A will be zero. And then the formulas are a bit easier because A is zero. So that drops out and we only are left with these three equations. We can again write down the time difference, the same formulas we saw on the previous slide, but now with A being substituted by zero. And this is it. Et voila, you have um, gotten your feet wet, eh, as they say. Second section. We're going to park the synchronous clocks for now. We will take them out of the. Uh, we will take them back again uh, once we need it. But now we are going to clear your mind, zoop, 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 erase. And let's see, we have two observers, observer one and two. And this is a funny story. Observer one says to observer number two, hey, I bought a nice rod. Here it is. <laughs> this is it, rod number one. And observer two says, well, I bought the exact same rod in a different color though at the same store. And this is my rod. And they are identical. As when, when observer one and two are addressed, both of them, they can, they can see that it's exactly the same rod. And then observer two has a crazy idea. He says, how about me running past you at a high speed and you look at my rod? 
<laughs> That's what he says. And, and Observer 1 says, awesome, let's do this. And he says, you know what? I'll make it even more crazy. I'll let light bounce up and down along my rod. <laughs> and Observer 1 says, well, this is epic, man. Let's do this. And this is the thought experiment Einstein is doing. He did not draw any pictures, no funny dialogues, but this is the experiment we are going to do in our heads and see what comes out of it. He uses symbols for the frame of references for Observer 1 and Observer 2. I use the term I4, which stands for inertial frame of reference and inertial means these frames are either at rest or traveling at a constant speed relatively to something else always and velocity is not an absolute it's always a relative quantity let's introduce two new events this will be the continuous story we will introduce new events try to write down location and time of these events for both observers do some mumbo jumbo with the equations and then the story develops. Observer number one, his rod, and I will say event number four is the first end of the stationary rod, the left hand side. And its location will always be zero for observer one, and the time will be now, can be any time because it's always there, it's not moving. And E5 will be the other end of the stick, and uh, I'm using my symbols here and the length of rod 1 through the eyes of observer 1. Einstein just uses the small letter L. Here we see it in his paper where he introduces L. Now we are going to fly by. Let's say Observer number two flew already past observer number one. So he's a little bit ahead. The velocity at which he flies, we will call the velocity of observer two through the eyes of observer one. Einstein just uses the small letter V. Um, imagine that the X axis of both observers are exactly on top of each other. Right, because the, all observers in special relativity are on the same single one dimensional road. And also imagine that when they pass each other, exactly when they are at the same spot on top of each other, then they sync their clocks by putting them both to zero. This is really helpful, otherwise, you get offsets and constants which complicate the story. So they set their clocks to zero. Well, Let's see what the event six looks like. Event six will be the start of rod number two. And for observer one, where will this be? Well, its location will be the velocity of observer two multiplied by the time it already passed observer one. There it is, V times T. And T will be T, the time of event six, and whenever he watches the rod, rod number two. Um, observer number two is way more easier because rod number two is at rest in the second frame of reference. So the x coordinate will always be zero at any time. So far, so good, right? Nothing funky going on here. Now we look at event number seven. And event number seven is being defined as the end of rod number two, the right end. And here we see that the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 2 is the same L we used earlier. Because they bought the rod in the same store, they were identical in length. Einstein says it here, gleich der Länge L des ruhende Straße sein. Gleich is equal, the, the same length L as the one that was uh, addressed in uh, frame of reference number 1. The X and T through the eyes of observer 1 are a little bit more difficult. The location of event number 6 through the eyes of observer 1, uh, event number 7, is the one event number 6 plus the length of the rod through the eyes of observer 1. And this is a big biggie. Here Einstein doesn't put in L. He does not assume that the length of the rod number two through the eyes of observer one is the same as the length of rod two through the eyes of observer two. 
or the same as the length of rod number one. And this is quite special, I would say, special. Um, because your intuition will tell you the rods are the same, so you, you can put in the little L again. No, it does not. And in the end, you know, we will see that it's actually a different length. He introduces new symbols again, R, A, B, and X prime. I found that confusing because X prime could be a time derivative. X prime in special relativity is usually something telling about the location of event for the second observer, not the first one. So that's why I always keep the notation I introduced next to the one of Einstein to avoid that confusion. And here Einstein says, das sie von L verschieden ist, eh? or he's saying like, it, it will be different, it could be different from the L. Event number eight. First we will see the observer two flying by. Here he is, woo! And he sings his clock eh, with, with observer one when they pass at uh, the origin. So that will be event number eight. They align, they, they meet each other, they sync their clocks, and then eh, observer two says, I will let light bounce up and down my rod while I'm passing you. So the light beam starts to travel from the left end side of rod two to the right end side of rod two. And that will have a location and time for both observers. And here it is in the timetable, the event table. Einstein calls it event A, capital A, when he is in observer one's perspective. He calls it uh, event number zero, when he's in observer two perspective. And he uses a different, uh, he uses the Greek tau for time for observer two and uh, keeps using the normal T we all know for observer one. And it's all zero because they synced. The location is zero and the time is zero. Event number nine, Einstein calls it B or one, is when the light reaches the end of rod two. Here it is. And because it took time for light to travel from the beginning of rod two to the end of rod two, rod two will be a little bit further away uh, through the eyes of observer one. Um, E9 will have an X and a T location, uh, an X location and a timestamp, of course, again. And here we have them in the timetable. Um, we use, again, tau for observer 2 and the regular T for observer 1. And if you want to know what is the location of event number 9 through the eyes of observer 1, well, that's simply the velocity of the observer, which is the same as the velocity of the rod, times the seconds it's already flying past eh, uh, observer 1, plus the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 1. And there it is, that's the equation. Now you can again take the time difference between these two, you can take the location difference between the two, substitute, shovel, move things around, uh, if, you, if you can just pause the video and see if you can do, repeat this on your own. And we get this equation, which is taken from the original paper. There we have it. You see that Einstein uses the, oh, uses the capital V for the speed of light. I'm, in, I'm using the C, <coughs> which is way more common today, of course, to use for the speed of light. And I'm using a capital V for the velocity of observer two through the eyes of observer one, which is a small v in Einstein's world. Event number 10. The light went back from the end of rod two to the beginning of rod two. Um, again, it will have a location and a time for both observers. And here it is in the event table. Uh, we stick to tau for uh, observer two, it's the second event. For me, it's event number 10. And then Einstein introduces T prime A, which is confusing for me because prime is usually used for the second observer. And now he uses it for the first observer. 
But there you go. And if you want to know where is the location of event number 10 through the eyes of observer 1, well, that's easy again. That's just its velocity, the velocity of the rod, times the seconds it took uh, to get to event number 10. And that is uh, the time E10 through the eyes of observer 1. Again, take the time difference, take the spatial difference, mumbo jumbo stuff around, and we get this equation which is taken from the original paper. This is the end of the second section. We're 20 minutes in, around 20 minutes I see. Um, and um, you can relax, you can take a break, whatever you want, but the third section starts now. Uh, yeah. We are going to go, we, we are going back to the synchronous clocks. So remember events number one, two, and three, where A was at the origin, uh, origin of uh, the observer, um, and we had uh, A set to zero, uh, and we saw that equation there from Einstein's paper, and then we can say time B, which is the time uh, stamp of event number two will be in between the timestamp of event one and three. Again, because uh, we assume that light goes back and forth and both delta t's are the same. So no matter where we are, uh, event number two will always be in the middle from a time perspective from those three events. Okay, remember? We're going to unleash that wisdom on event number 8, 9, and 10, which were pretty similar, right? Light bouncing back and forth, which was the same uh, uh, thought experiment we used uh, for events number 1, 2, and 3. So here we have it. So we can do the same. We can derive the equation that tau 1 will be in the middle of tau 0 and tau 2. And there you have it. Again, another equation from Einstein's paper. So the summary so far is we have introduced, next to the synchronous clocks, event 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. And here you see the locations and times for both observers using my notation and Einstein's notation. We can uh, uh, make sure that the length of the rod 1 through the eyes of observer 1 is the same as the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 2. That's both L, you know. But the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 1 is different. Uh, and Einstein uses X prime or sometimes he uses R A B. We know the time difference between 8 and uh, event 8 and 9, which gave us this equation. We know the time difference between 9 and 10, which gave us this equation. And we know the time uh, difference between 8 and 10, which gave us this equation. So this is what we have covered so far. Um, so, ha, she looks so happy. It's time to have coffee. Congratulate yourself, you've mastered it. The first pieces of the derivation. Relax, you can pause the video before we move on. Eight slides for the next break. Here we go. I have questions, so many questions. Why did he pick these events? Why not any other? Why just those? And what's next? And, and, and what are we after? You know, why are we doing this in the first place? Um, and I had to think about it quite some time because um, it's, it's not intuitive for me. You need to shut down intuition when it comes to special relativity. But events 1, 2 and 3 were all about synchronous clocks. 4, 5 and 6 and 7 were that um, the, the rod does not change through the eyes of the observer traveling with the rod. Uh, you could say it's like a physical law that stays the same for all observers. So it's, it's just an example of postulate number one. I'm not sure if the length of the rod can be called a physical 
law. Uh, but uh, yeah, that, that's what I made of it. And eight and nine, we needed uh, that, that the time is always in the middle of those bouncing back and forth. That's the constancy of speed of light. And event number 10 uh, is that it's synchronous. Now Einstein says, okay, I am, this is what we're after. I'm looking for a function, function number one, which tells me the location of any event through the eyes of observer two, if you give me the location and timestamp of that event through the eyes of observer one, together with the difference between us two. And that's the velocity of observer two through the eyes of observer one. And again, he uses Greek symbols, xi. And he also want to find a similar equation for time. Give me the time of an event through the eyes of observer two based on what observer one saw and the, and the speed difference between us two. And this is function number tau. Choosing your variables. This was for me, again, not that intuitive, but this is repeating what we just had. Einstein wants to do some calculus. I introduced calculus, I think in level three or four, but he wants to do partial derivatives. Uh, I am assuming that if you are still watching after like 25 minutes or so, that you know what partial derivatives are. Let's look at a generic function g, which has two variables, p and q. And with partial derivatives, we can say that if we want to know the value of function g, not at the point PQ, but a little bit further for P and a little bit further for Q, we can approximate that by taking the value at PQ plus the partial derivative in the direction of P times the difference in P plus the partial derivative in the direction of Q times delta Q. This is the approximation theory eh, or uh, I'm not sure how it's called, but it's in Leonard Euler, which we met in previous levels as well when we talked about the wave detectors. If you want to do this, it would be nice that P and Q are independent variables. Right? If it would be X and Y in a two dimensional plane, you know, they will be perpendicular and you would choose them perpendicular so they're independent. Well, spoiler, the velocity of observer two versus uh, through the eyes of observer one, X and T, you know, they might not be independent. So Einstein, and I think this is magic, you know, I still don't really get why he does this. I know what the consequences are of this choice, but he chooses his variables like this. He's saying, I am not going to use the velocity as a single variable. I'm going to use the X locations minus VT as a variable and he gives it the name x prime x prime it's you know this this bites me um again i will not be using x prime uh, i will always be using the full written down x minus vt thing and here we see the equation in einstein's paper so he chose his variables and now he's going to do the partial derivative stuff. Again, the two equations, this is X prime and oh yeah, I'm just repeating myself, eh? but X prime, if you look at it from a physical point of view, it's the length of the rod two in I for one, through the eyes of observer one. I had to think about that one, uh, but it's just the length of the rod two when you ask observer one. And you will look at rod number one because they, had, they were identical. But for observer two, it's not the length of the rod two through the eyes of observer one. No, it's the length of the rod through his eyes, or you could say an offset, a constant location in his frame of reference. Um, yeah, I just found this really tricky. I still do. And no matter how, how often I, I go back to it, um, 
it's, it's, it's the end of ROT2 for both observers, but at different locations. Not only because of that one is moving and the other one is not moving, but the, the length of the second rod doesn't have to be the same as the length of the first rod through the eyes of observer 1 while observer 2 is moving. Yeah, I have to, you, know, you have to say a lot to make clear what's going on here. So we have X prime for the observer 1 perspective and we have the L for observer 2 perspective. But, you know, I will just leave out X prime. Now we do mumbo jumbo. And we're going to do this a lot. And I, I, I hesitated, shall I make slides that explain each and every substitution and every shovel? Then this would be like a three hour video. So I'm not. I think you can follow. If you pause the video, take pen and paper, you can do this on your own. So we're going to fill in uh, the equation for event number eight. And we know event number eight was the start of the flash moving at the beginning of rod two. So the timestamp of that event was, uh, no, not the timestamp, the log well, x prime, x minus vt will be zero for event number eight. For event number nine, we get this one. And for event number 10, again, the x location will be zero. So x prime will be zero. Just pause the video. But this is the three timestamps through the eyes of observer two for events eight, nine, and 10. We're going to do the same for these three events through the eyes of observer one. We are going to repeat something we already know. Now we are going to shovel, and now you are able to tell the timestamps of these three events through the eyes of observer one. And here it is. Just take a picture because we will use these formulas. Uh, we will substitute these in the next slides to come. I made pictures as well. Here they are in a little bit smaller font because I keep forgetting it. And then uh, we repeat another equation we already know, tau one, which can be explained in two different ways, like the time difference between eight and 10. Uh, or the time of event 9 through the eyes of observer 2, but we also learned that it has to be in the middle of the timestamps of event uh, 8 and 10 through the eyes of observer 2. Um, let me see if I can follow really quickly. So we are just going to substitute tau 1 will be well, we can find, we can see what tau one well was, you know, up up in the right upper corner. So we're going to take that one, um, and we're going just to do mumbo jumbo. I'm just I'm I'm not more one step uh, back. So this is this is what you if you fill it all in, you get this. You know, you can do this. I can't do it real time. I I see that I can't. I've done this stuff. You know, I I when I punched in the equations. I actually used my editing software to substitute a shovel until I came to the final answer, which is here. And in Einstein paper, it looks like this. He uses four variables for the function tau. And the second and the third variables are y and z because he approaches this in a three-dimensional way, although the movement is only along the x-axis. At the end, Einstein finds out that there's nothing funky going on in the y or z direction, only in the x direction, in the direction of motion. I made it a little bit more easy for you and me as well. I just left out y and z. Uh, but if you ha do it strict, you would have to take them in. But I grade them out here. And now you see the formula taken from the paper and the formula which was already on there. Uh, you see that they match. And we can also do this eh, because we have two ways of defining tau 1. And we get this second equation for tau 1. And again, I grade out the y and z variables, which are zero always on the line of motion. So now it gets a little bit more complicated, right? We are again going to 
substitute things and tau zero will be zero. So the equations uh, simplify a little bit. So we have these two equations now. And then Einstein does another thing, which I, I know what he does. And, and I think I know why he does it, but he says, if we take X prime to be extremely small, uh, which we do in calculus all the time, then we can use Euler to approximate. Now he's going to do the calculus. So let's start with the second equation for tau 1. And then he says, well, tau 1 can also be seen as close to the partial derivative of tau to the first variable. Um, yeah, and the first variable is x prime, x minus vt. In E8, uh, at event number 8, times the delta, and that was the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 1. So he's assuming here very small rods, plus the partial derivative for the other variable at location 8 or event 8 times the delta of the second variable, which is there. Then he does the same for the first equation. And then he says, well, then these two have to be the same. So I repeat them. These two have to be the same. Well, there's a two in there. So you have to get rid of the two by dividing by two, shuffle, and et voila. <laughs> this is it, you know. And I, I literally substituted and shuffled around until I got this formula and the thing that bothers me is that it, it's valid only for very small rods and it's only valid for event number eight and Einstein then just generalizes this to any event and for any arbitrary length of the rods and that's something I still don't get there's just one little thing that has to click in my head to fully understand it. So if, if someone can help me out here, please do. But this is what he does. So I repeat it again. We are going to divide it, then it simplifies to this equation. And et voila, we see that equation in Einstein's paper as well. Here it is. He doesn't talk about event number eight. He has dropped that, that the partial derivatives are taken at that specific location in space time. But um, yeah, as I said, uh, one day it will click in my head why that is not an issue. This is just a partial uh, differential equation, I have to say. And if you had uh, had some, uh, some math in school and you had to learn how to solve partial der uh, derivatives, this is the solution for this partial, uh, this differential equation. A is here, uh, well, first let's see. We see again x minus vt, which is x prime for um, Einstein. We see uh, stuff in front of it, and we see A. And this is the equation uh, written down by Einstein in his paper. And where's A? I'm still waiting for A. Oh, yeah. And A is for now an unknown function of v and v is the velocity of observer 2 through the eyes of observer 1. And if you do this, eh, if, you, if you take this solution and you take the partial derivatives again, eh, you, you take the partial derivative of tau in the direction of x prime and you do plus v over v squared minus v squared delta tau delta t, you will see that it actually solves the differential equation. So this is a valid solution for tau with an unknown. I repeat it here. So you can pause. Eight slides to go. We are all 40 minutes in. Ah, we can take a break. We can take two breaks. I mean, I like this, this picture so much. She just gives me so much joy that, that when the going gets tough, I just look, ah, okay. No worries, it's all fine, it's okay. 
part, the next part. We are going to zoom in on event number nine when the light hits the end of rod two. Here's the generic solution for tau where a is a random function, an unknown function of v. Here we have uh, a summary of the three events from the event table. Um, and why am I putting a red box around L? Uh, I'm not really sure. But, uh, oh yeah, we are going to zoom in on event number nine and we're going to take a look at it from the observer two. So we want to know what's the X, what's the location of event number nine through the eyes of observer two. And then we apply um, the formula that we already had. It's C times the time it took because the time of event eight was set to zero. And then we can fill in tau one for these variables. And now we substitute the solution for tau and we get this equation. We can also uh, shuffle things around. Here you have to understand that uh, the, in, in the, in the, at the end of the formula, it says the, 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 the one in the middle, the formula in the middle, it says the time of event nine through the eyes of observer one. That's the same as the velocity of observer two through the eyes of observer one uh, divided by I want to get time so I need to divide by the speed and then yeah then we get meters so you can do this you know you have to write down t and then the v drops and you can shovel around and you get this equation and et voila here we have the similar equation in Einstein's paper using his symbols. I switch C and A, he has A and V, but you know, it's the same equation. Repeat, this is what we got. Um, we already know, yeah, that's TB. And now we can again substitute stuff in there. What, what am I doing? Oh yeah, I am now looking at, uh, one step back, we are now looking at the time of event number nine through the eyes of observer one, and which is this equation. And here we have the one from observer number two. And that's the X coordinate. And then the X coordinate for E9 through the eyes of observer two is this one. It's, 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 it's tedious. I, again, I can't do this real time. I, it took me a lot of time to write down these equations and shovel things around. But in the end, we find the location of event nine through the eyes of observer two is this. And it's again, the same as Einstein's formula in which he introduces beta. And beta is this beast here, one over the square root over one minus V over capital V squared. And if you do this, then uh, the function phi, I think it's V phi, uh, is uh, written down like this. So we still have A in there. And they, oh, again, confusing, you know. In the beginning, Einstein says, I'm using A as an unknown function of the velocity. And now he says A multiplied by V over the square root of V squared minus V squared is that function. Um, so A changed in my mind. But it doesn't matter, you know, it's, it's okay. It's okay. Then he does, you know, he says, well, this, this is what we all did for event number seven. Now we are going to do it for, uh, 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 we, we're going to uh, apply these equations for event number eight and 10 as well. So that generalization step is still not clear for me. But this is what he does. So we get the locations of the three events through the eyes of observer two. Um, and now we want to do it for time, right? So now we are going to look at time. Again, this is just substitute and shovel. Don't think about it. I didn't, well, I, I, I tried to, but then I just don't think about it. Let the math do the work. Just substitute and shovel. And you get this equation again with 
these two. Now I'm going to look at the timestamps of all three. Yeah, that is this. And and now 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 yeah, I mean if you thought this was confusing by uh, up until this point, he introduces a third observer, which is in the same seat as observer number one, and he uses capital K prime as the notation for that frame of reference, that inertial frame of reference. And he says the velocity of observer three through the eyes of observer 2 will be minus v. And that's true. I mean, if I'm stationary and you're traveling away from me at v, that person could also say, no, 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 I am stationary and you are traveling along to me. And because the x-axis are all pointing in the same direction, the sign changes. So we get minus v. And then he does this. He introduces another x prime, which we have been using all the time for the length of rod 2 through the eyes of observer 1. And that's the location of any event through the eyes of observer 3. Well, it's, it's just beyond me. But uh, he does, no, that, that, that sounded a little bit too, too negative. You know, it's, it's me. You know, I, ca I can't follow the, the rationale, the, the, the logic of, of these symbols. But, you know, um, T prime is used for the time. And then he makes it a generic again, and we get this. We get this equation, where you go from observer 1 to observer 2 for the x location of an event, where a is still the unknown function of v. And he does the same for t. So we, now we are closing in. We are closing in on the final piece. Because this is really clever. What he does is, he says, if I have an event and I know what the event was like for observer 1, I can use whatever we are looking for, eh? the, the, transformation we're, sorry, the transformation we're looking for, I can use that transformation to go from observer 1 to observer number 2. And then I can use the transformation again to go from observer 2 to observer number 2. 3, etc, etc. But I could also go from observer 1 directly to observer 3. So then I would apply the transformation we are after only once instead of twice. And the outcome should be the same. In fact, observer 3 is the same as observer 1. So you need to get back at observer 1. And this is what he does. And, and that's really clever. It's like saying something is linear. Hey, um, if you take intermediate steps or one big step, it should be the same. I'm in now I am introducing a really new symbol, QABA. Why? Because QAB is this beast. And I had, to, I had to write it down so many times and I made mistakes. So I said, no, 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 no. I am now going to introduce QBA and, um, you know, uh, because then the, the formulas do not blow up to incredible large sizes. And instead of observers one and two, I'm genericing it now. Genericing, that's probably not correct. Making it generic. I'm talking about observers A and B. And I'm saying the x-coordinate of an event through the eyes of observer B will be this Q multiplied by the x of the event through the eyes of observer A minus the velocity of B through the eyes of A times the time of the event through the eyes of A. Did I do it right? Yes, I didn't want to look. See if I can do it uh, in my head. And the same transformation for time. So we still don't know what, um, what A is, and therefore we don't know what Q is, and therefore we don't have the full transformation yet, but we are getting close now. So now I'm switching back from A to B to 1, 2, and 3. So this is the transformation to go from the uh, observations of observer 1 to observer 2 for the X location and for time. Yeah? We can also go from observer 2 to observer 3, which is there. But you can also say that is the same, and now we can substitute stuff. 
going uh, via to. And now I'm not going to explain how much, how many things are being swapped around, but um, yeah, this one I'm going to put in there, that one I'm going to put in there, and then you get this one, and then we get this one, and then we get this one, and then we get this one. Et voila! We find Q2, comma 1, which is gamma. We have found gamma, the Lorentz uh, constant, the Lorentz factor, the Lorentz factor. My memory is, uh, is not that good. The Lorentz factor, gamma. Here it is. It's not in its final shape yet, but um, uh, the, one done, the one that's being used all the time. But we get this. Now we are going to put it all together. This is the final slide, by the way. Well, it's not, I think I have the roadmap uh, uh, after this as well. But um, we found this one with gamma, this one. Yeah, this is the final shape. You can rewrite gamma in this shape. And this is the one that's really famous and being used everywhere in special relativity. And this is time. And this is the way Einstein wrote it in his papers using his symbols. We are now full circle. We have derived special relativity. Uh, and I hope this was helpful. If you take the original paper and you follow the steps that this helps you to get through that paper. Uh, this is how I got through still, you know, uh, as said, I keep repeating myself maybe too often. There are one or two moments in the in the, in the story where I feel a little bit uncomfortable, but that's because I am not a physicist, I am not a mathematician. So uh, that's probably why it's, uh, it's difficult for me. The roadmap, if you find like, wow, whoa, Tom, oh, I, I, uh, I want more. This is more. I made many videos eh? and um, I put them in levels and most levels have different parts or had targeted at different target audiences. Eh? Stuff that's easy for everyone, stuff that's for daredevils and stuff that is like this episode. Eh? This is probably one of the most difficult episodes of all of them, which we just did. Um, here is, uh, you can stop the video, but uh, here you can see all the levels with a short description. And if you don't want to do the math, you don't want to do all the physics, then I would say at least have a look at the one that I marked green. And here the red one is the one where we are right now. I think we are, well, we're not, not at one hour, but uh, over 15 minutes of painfully tedious substituting and shuffling. If you made it all the way through the end and made notes and tried to do it yourself, kudos. I want to thank you and the next level 26 will be uh, 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 not as difficult as this one and I hope to see you there. Thank you.